and welcome back to the channel. You can learn more about what makes a movie work from a bad film than from a good one. You can see plot twists that don't work and dialogue that lands on your ear like a cat turd in a litter tray. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Direction that breaks a 180 degree rule, so bad films can be educational. But they can also be entertaining. Some people call them guilty pleasures, but I prefer the term vulgar pleasure. I never feel guilty about watching movies. The five movies on this list aren't necessarily bad, but they've been called bad by other people, and I like them. There are two kinds of disaster movie. The ones where the protagonists have to survive a disaster over which they have no control. This involves running, jumping, diving, driving, and flying to get to a safe place. Movies like Greenland, 2012, The Day After Tomorrow, San Andreas and The Poseidon Adventure come under this category. Then there are the, to hell with this, let's fix this shit, disaster movies like Armageddon, Deep Impact, Crack in the World and The Core. With a number of exceptions, I prefer the let's fix this shit to the run and hide disaster movies, they're much more fun. And The Core is definitely that. First off, I admit the science is crazy. The core of the Earth stops rotating, which messes with the planet's magnetic field and allows powerful microwaves from the sun to pierce the atmosphere and to mess things up. Using a ship designed by marginalised genius Edward Brasselton, played brilliantly by Delroy Lindo, a team of scientists burrow to the core of the Earth to kickstart the centre of the planet with nuclear weapons. This mad movie gets some things really right. The set pieces, the landing of a space shuttle on the LA River, pigeons going crazy in London, and a journey into the heart of a geo the size of a city are mind-bogglingly enjoyable. The film also has a pretty solid cast, Aaron Eckhart and Hilary Swank, Stanley Tucci, DJ Qualls, Alfred Woodard and Richard Jenkins all bring their A-game to a B picture and I really like that. And it also has a pleasingly anti-authoritarian subtext. The core is one of those old-fashioned science fiction adventure films, the kind they don't really make anymore and it's immensely enjoyable. You go for the ride, you see things you haven't seen before, and the good guys prevail. Mockumentaries aren't anything new. It can be argued that Citizen Kane starts with a mockumentary. News on the mark! This obscurity was released on VHS in Australia back in 1990. The more you know about cinema history, the funnier it is. That's Adequate was created by Harry Hurwitz, who started out in the business producing softcore adult films like Adult Fairy Tales, and a weird movie that combines Dracula with Disco, Nocturna, in 1979. But it's clear that Harry was a cinephile too. He wrote this movie, and it's got so many deep-cut references in it. That's Adequate is the story of Max Roebling, played by James Coco, and his studio Adequate Pictures. From the silent era to the then modern day, Adequate's output of shoddy, derivative, idiotic and at times dangerous movies satirises the whole history of cinema up to that point. From a pastiche of the jazz singer where a, the black son of a jazz singer wants to become a cantor in a synagogue, to an adult version of Gone with the Wind and a 1950s style action movie called Einstein on the Bounty, which stars a very young Robert Downey Jr., this movie blasts its jokes out with shotgun delivery, satirising, amongst others, the Three Stooges, the Marx Brothers, Psycho, Closeted Cowboy Actors, We Are the World Celebrity Charity Events, and, strangely but very funnily, Rudolph Valentino. Anything happened during the making of the film? Oh, a lot of people uh, got divorced. Public domain movie footage is repurposed to aid the story in an imaginative way. And not all the jokes land, some of them are definitely not safe for work, but others are really funny. The movie has a deadpan narration by Tony Randall, and cameos by people like Bruce Willis, Ben Stiller, his parents Jerry Stiller and Anne Mirror, Robert Vaughan, and many other familiar faces. The planet Gorgle has sent a spaceship to intercept us. It's extremely difficult to find this movie and it's well overdue for a DVD or Blu-ray release if a good original source can be found. If you can find a copy of it, you'll probably enjoy it. Mm -hmm. 
Lily and Lana Wachowski's hyperkinetic remake of Yoshida Tatsuo's iconic 1960s anime, Maha Go Go Go, is one of those films that copped a lot of critical flack when it was released, but has found an audience over the 13 years since then. By the way, if you're in Australia, the movie is streaming on the Stand platform at the moment, and you can watch the original anime on the Anime Lab streaming service. Translating from the limited animation of the original 1967-1968 TV series to a widescreen feature-length film wasn't easy. The limitations of the anime were overcome by innovative direction, impossible camera angles, sharp sound design and fast-paced brassy music. The movie really embraces that aesthetic and takes it into hyperspace. At the time it came out, it was criticised for headache-inducing special effects, and one critic called it a misstep of epic proportions, an overbearing mix of candy-coated visuals and an incoherent plot. But Speed Racer was intended to be totally in the audience's face. The super-saturated colours, the stylized, almost cartoonish landscapes, the camera point of view that darts around like a thirsty hummingbird, imaginative wipes and dissolves were all intentional. Granted, the first 15 minutes of the film is an information dump about Speedy's family, their history, and the car racing oriented world they live in. And the Wachowskis don't ease you into this world. They expect the audience to be strapped in, and then they put the pedal to the metal. I like this film a lot. The human characters and the chimp are secondary to the story and the way it's told. There's a subplot about corporate media manipulation and how the very rich monetize and engineer the passion of the masses. But the boldness of the storytelling and the creation of a three-dimensional world that stays completely true to the source material is a great achievement. It's a lot of fun. Now we're getting deeply into the weeds with this all-but-forgotten trilogy of 1970s sexploitation action movies, which, oddly enough, may be the first action movie trilogy with a female protagonist. The movies Ginger, the Abductors and Girls of Her Loving were the brainchild of a Manhattan grindhouse cinema owner, Don Shane. They starred Sherry Cafaro as tough bisexual adventurous Ginger McAllister. Shane and Cafaro married soon after the first movie, Ginger, was made, and the sequels, I suppose, became a family business. With sometimes dodgy acting, kinky sex, kung fu stouches with laughably bad fight choreography, and some sketchy production values at first. They get better as the trilogy moves on. The Ginger movies are definitely a vulgar pleasure. Sherry Kafaro was great playing a tough chick and had a certain charisma that made the character work even when the dialogue is clunky as hell. But she couldn't sing, she danced okay, and she was not a great martial artist. The first two movies are about investigating and bringing down gangs who force women into sex work a subject which in 1970s Manhattan Grindhouse cinema owner like Don Shane surely had some at least anecdotal knowledge. And the third, with improved production values, including location shooting in the Virgin Islands, is about blackmailing US diplomats overseas to get insider information on government contracts for stock market manipulation purposes. None of these movies are now considered socially acceptable and they wouldn't be made. But that's okay, culture moves on. I have to acknowledge them as part of my film viewing history. And I can watch them for their clunky grindhouse awfulness while wincing at the film's sexual politics. Weirdly, there are subplots against slut-shaming and about female empowerment which feel oddly contemporary in a really messed up way. If this is your bag, you might enjoy the Ginger Trilogy, but if you don't, I totally understand why. Yellowface acting is never okay. It wasn't when Mary Pickford did it or Catherine Hepburn or Louise Rayner or Mickey Rooney. And it's not now. Having said that, Betty Davis playing a half-Chinese female Fu Manchu in this 1970s television Eurospy movie, which was shown in cinemas in some countries, is problematic but strangely entertaining. And it's a good little spy movie. Robert Wagner plays Anthony Lawrence, a retired CIA agent who is kidnapped by Madame Sin to help her hijack a Polaris submarine, for which she has a buyer. Madame Sin is a genius with sonic weaponry and brainwashing, and is always two steps ahead of Lawrence all through the movie. 
The film was shot in London and Scotland and it was the most expensive TV movie of its time. Director David Green, who had a long history in episodic adventure TV shows, gives us a great looking world of groovy 1970s clothing and furnishings and a plot with just enough twists and toughness to keep the bums in the seats. Wagner is good as Lawrence, a tougher character than his Al Mundy in It Takes a Thief, and he faces genuine shocking challenges while trying to defeat the Dragon Lady. The movie was actually a pilot for a proposed TV series that never happened as well. And the supporting cast is solid, including Denholm Elliott, Gordon Jackson, Catherine Schell and Dudley Sutton. And the production's budget is all there on the screen. But as I said, it's problematic and somewhat old fashioned even in the 1970s. But I like it because it encapsulates a moment in popular culture. And when I watch it, it always keeps me entertained right up to that grim climax. So I hope you enjoyed me talking about these five vulgar pleasures of mine. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing, hitting the like button, and maybe hitting the notification bell so you know when a new video is coming out. As always, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies that you love unashamedly. Get the jab, which I am getting my first shot on Monday, and I will catch you later.